Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Bill Triggs. Um, most of you know him from his extensive research in computer vision. He's very well known for one of the first uh, projective factorization, structure for motion algorithms, uh, the great survey and bundle adjustment. He's also worked on feature detection. And more recently, he's been working on object and people uh, detection and recognition. And Bill works at uh, the INRIA lab in Grenoble in the Lear team. He actually has a position with CNRS, and he's going to be um, deputy director of the new CNRS lab in INRIA. Okay. Guess, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I'll just start with a little couple of slides on the team and the con general context, and then I'll go on to, 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 to describe some work. Um, so the team is called Lear for Learning and Recognition. Um, so we work in a number of different areas. Um, there's a basic core of expertise, which is um, robust visual features, both interest points and, and, and dense features. Um, extraction of invariant descriptors for images, this kind of thing. Um, and then we also do a little bit of work in, in statistical and machine learning, um, particularly with applications to visual recognition. Um, and then those techniques we use for um, a number of different con areas. Um, one is content-based image retrieval. Um, so we're interested in being able to look at, take a large number of images and find repeat the same structure in, in some example image or say what's in the image and be able to search the, the database according to you know, the presence of a building or a person or something like that. Um, one of the things that gets used for that is a lot of um, texture and image classification so we can classify local regions of image or whole images according to some kinds of content. Um, we can sometimes segment types of things there. It's a little bit difficult to see, but there's a segmentation of a spotted animal according to a texture, or there there's a segmentation of a motorbike according to um, sort of little image patches that are characterized as being motorbike or not. Um, associated also with that, there's a lot of work on object recognition, so to being able to find the existence and whereabouts of a given type of object in an image, so bicycles or horses or cars or whatever. Um, a special case of that is human detection, and I'll talk a bit about that. Um, so we have um, a number of different methods for detecting faces, humans, um, this kind of thing. And then a, f a final area is um, human motion recognition. So we're able to reconstruct human motions from um, images or videos, human poses or motions from images and videos, and I'll show something of that later. Um, in the team, there's... Um, Actually, the slide is rather old. There's uh, Cordelia Schmid, who's an expert on um, invariant features, things like that. Um, there's Frederick Jury, um, who is also an expert on recognition and visual features. And there's me, who does various different types, types of things. Um, there's a, pr a professor who's actually not really very much involved in the group because he's, he runs a school, or almost a small university, called ONCIMAG, which is the engineering university in Grenoble. Um, and there's actually two more people, two more permanent staff just come in, um, one of whom works in coding theory and the other one works in, in um, machine learning. And then there's a, a, a list of other people. And um, I can go through it. There's a lot of European projects and there's lots of collaborations with um, Oxford and Illinois and Australian National University, things like this. Um, but let me stop there and um, go on to the work. Oh, I should also say that um, the context... The, the more general context is um, is that um, this is a team, um, and in the same building, there are two other vision teams. So one is called Movie, um, which works on um, geometric modeling, um, multiple cameras, so 3D reconstruction for multiple cameras, um, for example, human motion in real time, um, some things like that tend a little bit towards graphics, like re recovering lighting and things like that from cameras. And there's another team called Prima, which is um, it's Jim Crowley's team. So that's involved in um, kind of vision systems, so um, 
being able to count people and images, um, automated office environments, this kind of thing. Um, so they have, they're quite productive in that area. And then there's two big graphics teams. Um, one artist is Francois Sillon's team, so they're interested in geometry, um, um, non-photorealistic non rendering, um, various other kinds of things like that. And then Evasion, which is Mary Paul Carney's team, so they're interested in modeling of natural scenes of all types. So um, they, they tend to, to use um, partial differential equation methods or um, some kind of flexible geometric models and things like that to model, for example, flows of lava or um, forests or um, um, trees moving under the wind, this kind of, kind of thing, and also do a little bit of human motion. So that cluster of teams all together <coughs> is probably the biggest cluster of um, graphics and, and, and vision expertise in France. And you know, all of those teams are quite well known internationally and things like this. Okay, so let me just go on to the work that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about two pieces of work. Um, and if you want to ask me questions about other things I've done, then feel free as well. Um, so the first thing is, is some human detection work, um, which it's kind of resolved itself into a study of low-level things to make, to make the detector work well. Um, so it's a little bit detailed. Um, but the result of the study was, was a human detector that works quite a lot better than the previous ones. So this was work mainly done by my doctoral student, Navneet Dalal, um, who just finished and who now works for RIA, so the photo organization company. So we're interested in detecting people and images. Um, and the applications, particularly we're focusing on um, media analysis, so we'd like to be able to take things like personal photos or, um, or um, home videos, this kind of thing, and find people in them, so to be able to, to say what content is, is in these things. Um, there's also potential applications in video surveillance in this, these kinds of areas, um, both for security but also for, for example, um, old age people. Very, very often the, you want to be able to, f to find, you know, are they safe? Um, is, is, has anything gone wrong? So this kind of analysis. Um, and potentially also things like pedestrian detection for smart cars. It's another application for this, this kind of technology. Um, so the difficulties are that people appear, they can appear anywhere in the image at any scale. Um, they have extremely variable appearance. So um, different clothing is kind of designed to make the vision task difficult. Um, it's often uniform and you can't detect where the contours of the person are. Sometimes it's tight, sometimes it's very loose and you can't see where the, the edges of the actual human body are. Um, people have all kinds of poses and things. Um, the, the problem is generally it's one of the more difficult recognition problems because of the huge variety of different appearances that people can take. Um, so um, in this work we're going to make a restriction which is that we're only going to be able to work with upright fully visible people which we kind of call pedestrians, but they could be walking or running or standing or they could be seen from the front or the back or the side, anything like that. But we want to see the whole person. Um, and some example images from the, of the kind that we want to deal with there. Okay, so the detective detect framework that we're going to use is very classic. Um, and in some sense you might say, well, it's not, not very interesting. Um, but the, 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 the devil is in the details here. If you get all the details right, your performance, you know, by, by, by fixing a certain number of details, we, we increase the performance by at least two orders of magnitude. Um, so not all implementations of apparently the same idea are equivalent. Um, so the basic way that this was going to work is that we're going to um, take the images, calculate a, a scale space pyramid with rather fine sampling between the different levels and we're going to scan at all positions of the image and at all scales a detector over the image and declare um, that we've detected a person when the, de when the, the classifier in the, in the detection window fires and says this is a person. Okay. Um, so we need to extract features over all the windows, run some kind of classifier. In our case this is going to be a linear SVM so we're going to take the simplest possible classifier in some sense, the simplest possible modern reliable machine learning based classifier. Um, but we're going to work a lot on the features to try to get reliable features. Um, and then there's a final stage because these classifiers will tend to fire several times in adjacent positions or adjacent scales. So there'll be a scale, a, a fusion process <coughs> which takes the, these, a cluster of detections and returns a single detection. Um, 
So the focus is going to be on robust um, feature sets, both for static images, so single images, and also for motion, and then on the fusion process. Um, and another thing is, that's important is that when you train these things, retraining in the right way is very important to get good results. So I'll talk a bit about that. Um, current feature sets, um, probably the most popular feature set are these, these Haar-like wavelets or Viola-Jones type of wa wavelet or um, features, which are you know, square blocks of image which, which you take. Um, so that approach, I guess, was probably started by Papa Giorgio and Poggio um, back sort of five to ten years ago almost. Um, and then Viola and Jones, and Peter, Papa Giorgio and Poggio were using an SVM. Um, and then Viola and Jones brought in this, this, this wonderful idea of using um, a, a classification or a rejection chain um, with AdaBoost as, as a, a local learning process, which um, has been a very, very fruitful idea. But we're not going to use that. We're going to use a simple <coughs> linear SVM. Um, and then another technique that's kind of important to know about is Gavrilla's work on, on edge-based templates, so exemplars. Um, you've probably seen um, the Blake and Toyono, Toyama work on, on exemplars. But even before that, there was work by Gavrilla on detecting people in images. Um, and basically the idea is you just take a large number of examples of people, use some kind of robust feature coding, so um, in their case they were detecting edges and then calculating distance transforms, matching to this big database of people in different poses. And if they get a close match, then they've detected the person. Um, and they, they managed to make that run quite quickly. And then there's a whole other family of techniques that basically use articulated models of people and have the problem that an articulated model of a person has to be somehow fitted into the image. So the joint angles have to be, have to be chosen correctly. Um, so an example of that kind of work is Felsen Schwab and Hattenlocker's um, work. So typically one can use dynamic programming to try to get an optimal position of the person. Um, we haven't used that, and I should say that those kind of approaches are interesting theoretically, but if you compare with the performance of a detector that simply takes, that learns from images without any internal structure to detect people, then um, the, 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 this monolithic approach, we don't have to estimate joint angles, just works so much better in practice that, um, that there's, there's no competition at the moment. Um, so ultimately, we believe that these model-based methods with joints and things are going to be useful somewhere, but uh, at the present, they're just not reliable enough to compete. Um, so if our approach looks simple, it's not because we're simple-minded. It's because we've looked at the others and they didn't work as well. Um, and there's various <laughs> other approaches. Um, Bastian Lieber um, uh, has worked on uh, interest point-based methods for detecting people. Um, He's claiming similar results to us um, for some images, but he's chosen his images rather carefully, and we find we don't get similar results, that, that our method is working a lot better than that. Um, and then Christian Mikulajczyk had this um, human detector um, back in ECCV 2004, which is in some sense similar to ours. It uses, um, it uses local features and then looks at histograms of them. Um, so it's similar to the Schneiderman face detector, if you know that but with slightly different features. Um, and then it again uses A to boost. So that's an interesting method to look at. OK, so our method is going to use what we call histogram of oriented gradients. Um, and that's closely related to SIFT features. So if you know SIFT features, what you do is you take, for pure SIFT, you, t you detect image points, interesting points in the image using normally Laplacian of Gaussian detectors, but it could be Harris detectors or anything else. And then you take a small piece of image and you calculate oriented gradients in blocks near to that piece of image. You do some normalization, and then that's your detector. So what we're going to do is that we're going to, instead of detecting interest points, we just take a grid of these SIF-like features, um, and we'll use those as, as our feature sets. Um, and I should say that for people who don't know about orientation histograms, Bill Freeman in about 96 had this um, television command method that just looked at a, a region of image that might contain a hand and looked at the orientations in that global region and was able to find hand gestures and things like that quite well. Um, and even 10 years before that, there's a patent on using orientation to do these kinds of things. So it's, a, it's an old idea, 
but it's an idea that, again, you have to get the details right to get it really performing well. And um, the SIFT and the, the, the now method seems to be the, the right way to do these things. Okay, so onto the details of the method. Um, I said we're going to take a detection window and run it across the image. Um, and there's various different stages of the process. So first of all, we take the image. We're going to do some kind of gamma normalization, um, which is designed to um, even out the intensity differences between well-lit areas of the image and poorly lit areas of the image. Um, so typically, for example, a square root there is about the right thing to do. If you take a full log, so in, in, in general, you might say that um, illumination is a multiplicative process. So if you double the intensity of a light, then um, the intensity in the image obviously doubles. Um, and you want to be invariant to that because often the illumination is very different in different parts of the image. Um, so because that's a multiplicative process, if you take the log and the principle, you're kind of, you're, you're back into a linear framework for doing the, things. The, the light, the actual gray level values coming out aren't doubled because there's already a gamma, a display gamma in most cameras, right? Sure, sure. Um, so when we say normalize gamma, um, the problem is that when we get our images, we don't necessarily know what the gamma of the camera is. Right. Um, but a, a, a native CDD is pretty linear until it starts saturating. Um, so right, if, if, but if it comes off of a camera or a JPEG file, someone's already applied a gamma to it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so we simply apply another gamma to it. Um, and that gamma, I don't know, I mean, we're using consumer cameras here. Um, I guess we could try to figure out what the overall product of the gamma is, but it, it turns out that something like square root is usually the best thing to do, and sometimes it's even better not to do anything. Um, the log is certainly too strong, and anything super linear is certainly too, much, much too extreme. So it, it's somewhere in that square root to, yep. to unit thing that seems to be the right thing. Um, <coughs> and all of, all of these stages do bring a performance benefit, so you, you, you see the performance benefit in each case. Okay, so we're going to normalize the gamma, then we compute image gradients. Um, I'll say a little bit about the different ways of computing image gradients in, in a second. Um, and then we're going to do this weighted voting into spatial and orientation cells, and I'll say a little bit about, about that as well. So that's this SIFT-like or histogram of oriented gradients process. Um, that's followed by a strong normalization which is local to the blocks that you're working over. Um, again, that's trying to get you more invariance to changes in illumination, changes in local contrast. Um, and then you just collect all of these features that you've got in the blocks into a big vector, and you learn a linear SVM on them. Um, we can also learn a nonlinear SVM, but it turns out that the linear SVM is almost as good, and it's a thousand times faster. Um, so we tend to use linear SVM as our default detector. Um, and linear SVM, because you can integrate the support vectors into the detector. It's just a simple dot product type of thing. So you can, you can say that really what we're doing is a kind of a feature extraction and then template matching in this feature extracted space. Um, and why use, a linear S, why use an SVM rather than some other method? Well, that seems to be a, a reliable, rapid kind of um, learning method. So we just find, use that as a default method. Um, OK, so let's talk about the geometry here. Um, so there's a couple of parameters that are important. We're going to work over small blocks of image which contain a certain number of pixels. Okay, so we'll call those smaller blocks cells. And then those cells are put into, um, into a, a certain array, local array, which we'll call a block. Okay, so typically a, a classic SIFT has 4x4 four four pixel cells, and it has 4x4 four four cells in a block. Um, in our case, we found that something a little bit coarser tends to be better. So we tend to have, um, for example, 8x8 um, eight eight pixel cells, but only 2x2 two two cells in the block, or sometimes 3x3 three three, um, cells in the block, and then the cells are about 6 in size. Those are the kinds of things that work well for the, 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 the method that I'll, that I'll give later. OK, so the geometry is there. There's also another alternative geometry, which is to use circular blocks instead of, um, instead of rectangular ones. Um, it doesn't, the results don't seem to be too sensitive to the choice of that. This is a little bit more messy to implement because you've got to decide where pixels lie in, in the block. Um, and it gives slightly better results, but I wouldn't say that the difference is really significant. And then we have a couple of different ways to um, 
to do the internal thing here. We can either cross across, so we have um, radial cells all everywhere, or we can just have a central disc and then a radial radial thing outside. And then these these things in the, in, in this um, the circular thing, the the channels are spaced radially, or lot in log space, so the the scale increases logarithmically as we go out. Um, so this is very similar to a shape context type of thing, except that we're voting with orientation in each of these regions, whereas the original shape context didn't do that. The, 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 the more recent shape context, the generalized shape context, does do that. Um, but that's kind of based on the success of SIF. Okay, um, so I said something about the geometric organization. Um, there's a couple of other things. Um, how do we calculate gradients? Um, and I'll show a graph on that in a second. It turns out that the simplest possible method of calculating gradients is by far the best. Um, and then another thing that we do is that we have these blocks and we overlap them. So typically, a given cell will actually appear several times in the output feature vector. And the only thing that's different is that it's normalized in a with respect to a different block. So the blocks are normalization regions. Um, and normalizing a different cell several times with respect to a different block gives you even more invariance with respect to changes in local lighting. So it again improves the performance. Um, in terms of the normalization, there's various different schemes that we'd use. Um, let me not go into too much detail on that, but I'd just say that it does make a difference what scheme you use. OK, um, so I'll come back a little bit to the, some graphs in a second and just talk about data sets. So the original data set is this Papa Giorgio data set, which is people taken from the front or the back in, MIT, in or near MIT, so um, kind of urban summer scene. Um, there's a certain number of images and things. Um, and then we found that this database is much too easy. Um, so we filmed another data, we made another database just from personal photos. This is Navneet's personal photos, plus a few other things that he found. Um, the difference is that the scenes are often much more crowded. The people are certainly much less often upright, and they're definitely not always seen from the front or the back. Um, and they're not urban also. There's a lot of scenes in the mountains, scenes on beaches or on holidays and things like this. Um, so the, the database is considerably more variable, um, and that makes it more interesting for our kind of purposes. So the way he took this database, the MIT database, they went out and they shot images of people, and they knew what the subject was, I think. Um, whereas Navneet's database, what he's done is he's taken a set of holiday images, um, and he's pulled the people out of those images. But the people that he's pulling out are often in the background. So they could be having a conversation with someone else, or facing behind, or doing whatever they're doing. So it's much more like a, a neutral sample of the typical poses that people have. Whereas the MIT, it's kind of, it's almost posed in the sense that the people are taken from front or behind. Okay, um, so just to give you a first overall overview of the performance of this thing, um, <coughs> what I'm going to plot here for the performance of the overall detector are what are called debt curves. Um, so we plot misrate um, versus false positives per window tested. Okay, um, so... Um, MIPS rate is 1 minus hit rate or 1 minus true positive rate. So this is the same information as a rock curve, but we're plotting, typically we plot both on the logarithmic scale, which gives us much better access down into the deep regions of, of this thing. And in particular, I'll say that um, for human detection, we're looking at false positives per window here, but typically an image will have 10 to the 4 windows or something like that. So if we want less than one false positive per image tested, then we're in this range of 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 5. So this is the interesting region for the detector. Um, if people plot a rock curve, normally they only show this slice in here. Um, so you don't even see the performance in the region that you want to test, test it in. Um, so this is why we're not plotting rock curves. OK, so um, these are the, the two curves contain the same information here. All that I'm doing is that I'm plotting the miss rate here on a linear scale um, just to show the results. So our detector is way down here almost off the scale, and this is why we're plotting it on a linear scale for the MIT database, um, because on a log scale, it's just way off the scale. Um, other detectors, even the best MIT detector, um, well, the parts-based detectors are there, but the best baseline detector is up here. Um, 
So, so we're doing considerably better on the MAT data set. We've tr tried various other things. PCA SIFT we find doesn't work well as a feature, um, despite the claims of the authors. The wavelet feature sets tend not to work as well as these histogram of oriented gradient ones. Um, what else is there there? Um, well, let me let me get, let me just go on. Um, so this is on our data set, um, and we're interested in performance around this region here. So we're missing maybe 10% of the people for 10 to the minus 4 false, false positives per image, which is like f per window, which is like one false positive per image or something like that, depending on the size of the image. Um, so that's the kind of performance that we're getting. It's still not satisfying. We'd like to be an order of magnitude or two lower in false positive rate, and we're working on it, but um, it's, it's a difficult problem. Okay, um, so that's the same curve again. Let me go move on. Okay, so what parameters make a difference in this? Um, so the first thing that makes a huge difference is how much you smooth. Um, and it turns out that any kind of gradient smoothing kills your performance. Um, and this is something that SIFT, typically you have a gradient smoothing of three pixels, sigma of three pixels or something. If you do that, um, you're up here in performance. So remember that this is a log scale, so the, between here and here, there's at least an order of magnitude in, in false positive rate difference. Um, How big are your background people typically in pixels? Uh, the, the size of the people in, the size of the window is 64 by 128, and inside that window, people are typically 100 pixels high. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's, there's one other thing that's a kind of gotcha, um, which is that, for example, the viola and Jones pedestrian detector work, the people are about half that size. Um, and as you reduce the size of the people, um, what tends to happen is that it becomes more critical not to smooth, um, but you, different, different types of features become useful. Um, I'll go into, when we talk about motion, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but here, I should say that I guess the people are rather large for, for the kinds of, um, you know, you, you can't detect really small people with this detector. You need people who are 100 pixels high, which is a substantial size still. Um, and um, even then, no, gr having no gradient smoothing is really important. Um, so as you get smaller, things get, it's, it's even more important not to have gradient smoothing. So th the lesson... If you get larger, does it ever, is it ever beneficial to smooth? Sorry? Is it ever beneficial to smooth, say, if you get larger, if you get larger people? <coughs> I don't know, you'd have to run the experiments, but my intuition is not. Um, well, it depends. I mean, if, if your people, if, if the, the cells that you're working over are so, so large um, that, um, that they can pick up fine texture detail in the people, which is not too relevant to the actual form of the person, then you'd have to smooth. Okay, so the, the thing is that with the kinds of, let me just go on. Here a second. That's, that's the size of a typical um, block on the person. So you can see that the size of a cell is roughly the size of a human limb. Okay? Um, and the size of the block is kind of, well, it's the, the size of the cell is the width of the human limb, and the size of the block is something, something like the length of half a human limb or something. So it's kind of scaled to the scale of the people in the images. Um, if things were much, much finer, then yeah, may, sorry, if things were much, much coarser, then maybe you, you would want to smooth some more. To get, the thing is that you pick up different information at different scales. Um, but at the scale that we're looking at here, um, you don't want to smooth because you're just obliterating the details that, that characterize the form of the person. Um, Where would you bring the image? Super, uh, subsampling the image at different um, ratios, right? Yeah, we work so over when, when you say yeah. smoothing, you mean you get that, that patch and then you smooth it by... Yeah, the, 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 the detector always works in a window which is 64 by 128 okay. at the current scale of the pyramid. Okay. okay. So we've done whatever subsampling <laughs> that we have and then we smooth or In fact, we don't smooth well, that, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. That's equivalent to if you actually just took the original image and blurred it and then that shows an input to the whole pyramid array, right? Um, you could, in principle, calculate the... But you're avoiding aliasing on the downsampling, but anyway, so... When we downsample, we try to downsample as well as we can, yes. Right. 
um, I, would, I was thinking that if you actually had noise in your image, then it might start to be important to smooth. Unless you're doing kind of night imaging or imaging with funny military sensors or something, noise is just not an issue as far as I can see. Um, it's, yeah, noise becomes an issue if the shutter is really quick or things are really dark. But apart from that, you know, you're talking about a few pixels of noise, a few grade levels of noise. Um, and um, with modern sensors, that's not the issue. The, the issue is um, trying to separate what is form from what is background or what is incidental detail, like the texture on someone's shirt or something. Um, so, so I think noise is, is overused as a, a term in vision, basically. So, so um, in the but, end, when you say no, no smoothing, just take the uh, difference, the finite difference between adjacent pixels for yeah, resolving let, vertically. Let, let me go back to that. So um, here, here are the different things. Now, what the best, the best mask, mask for gradient calculation turned out to be 1, 0, minus 1. Okay? Um, and we tried all kinds of different things. We tried Sobel, so you also have some smoothing in the opposite direction. Um, we tried various kinds of end correction things designed to um, either smooth things or increase the frequencies that you can pick up. Um, all of them made the, things, made the situation worse. I mean, if, if you change things only a small amount, that it only makes the situation slightly worse. Um, but it does make the situation worse. We also, um, okay, so we're calculating um, oriented gradients, and it's important that we evaluate the vertical and horizontal derivative at the same point. Okay, so we use 1, 0, minus 1. Um, we also tried using 1, minus 1 type of masks. Um, that doesn't give you a centered derivative, and it turned out to be worse. And the, the thing that you can do with the smallest spatial scope is to use 45 degree, and then you can use a, uh, minus 1, 1, and 1, minus 1, and that gives you only root 2 distance between the 1 and the minus 1 instead of 2 distance. Um, but again, that didn't help. Um, so we, we, did, we did try the, the various possibilities, everything that we could think of. Um, and most of these things that have small gradient scale have similar performance. You don't lose very much. You can see that there's a big cluster of results here. Um, but nevertheless, not smoothing was important. So the philosophy here is that what you're doing is that you're extracting some kind of feature from the image at the current scale that you have. Then you're doing this orientation voting, which is like a nonlinear rectification step. It takes a part of the image and it always gives a positive signal out. Okay? And then you can smooth. So then you have these spatial cells over which you smooth the results. Um, and if you do things that way, you're, you're kind of picking up the maximum signal that you can find in the image and then doing some spatial smoothing to get some invariance to position in the image, this kind of thing. Whereas if you, if you just blur the, gra the gradients um, before using them, then you lose information. So, I mean, the same thing is visible if you go back to these curves and you look at the wavelet results. So wavelets are way up here, um, whereas these histogram of oriented gradients are down here. The wavelets are just calculating derivatives at too high a scale, so they don't see good, good results. Um, other conclusions, um, it turns out that sampling finely in orientation is important. Um, we typically use nine spatial channels, um, and that's over 180 degrees, so we don't look at the sign of the gradient. So if there's a gradient pointing in that direction or one pointing in the opposite direction, they go into the same bin. Um, but for different classes, for cars, for example, it's better to separate the two bins in that case. But for humans, their clothing is always different colors, so you don't get any, the, the sign of the gradient doesn't really tell you anything. It's just the, the orientation that tells you something. Um, different normalization methods for the blocks. Um, if you don't do normalization, you're way out here. So normalization is incredibly important. Color, right? I didn't understand if you use color. Yeah, um, I didn't say anything about color. What we do with color is we, we tried various different color spaces, but it turns out that just using RGB is the best. And what we do is that we take gradients in each spatial channel, in each color channel. So we take R gradients, G gradients, and B gradients and we just take the maximum at a given pixel, so the gradient with the maximum modulus at a given pixel. Oh. Um, if, if you combine them, it doesn't really change the results. Um, so there's various <coughs> different things that you can do. But fancy color spaces like lab and, and things like that didn't really seem to help. Um, and you're always voting by the modulus, right? You multiply the, for a given orientation, you yeah. accumulate the modulus. Yeah, so I don't think I actually have a graph on that. Or, or um, the modulus after normalization, right? So no, what, so what happens is you do the gamma, 
So you've kind of done some suppression. Calculate the gradients. Then you calculate the orientation and modulus. And you use that for voting. Okay? And then you normalize the whole block at once. Um, if, if, you, if you do um, edge detection, so you, take, you decide whether the gradient um, is non-zero or zero, um, that doesn't give you good results. Um, on the other hand, probably voting linearly is a little bit too strong. So we tried various schemes, but we, I mean, the results were not so clear on that. Um, so what I tend to do is to have a little bit of a dead zone. So um, you have some, if the gradient is below a certain threshold, you don't count it at all, and then things go linearly up from there. What's the logic improvement from going from black and white to color? <sighs> I, for humans, I don't think there was much improvement. Um, for other classes, there can be a bit of improvement. It, it depends. Um, if you've got classes that have strongly characteristic colors, um, and cars, for example, are a class like that because the wheels are always black, um, well, unless you've got white sidewalk wheels. But, um, <laughs> so, um, so, so there are things like that that turn out to be quite, quite useful. But for humans, the, the thing is that you see many clothing, and the clothing can be any, any color at all. And often a lot of the texture that you see in the image is just completely irrelevant. Um, so humans are a difficult class for that reason. Um, yeah, so different normalization methods. Um, basically, we came to the conclusion that either the, what we're calling um, L2 hysteresis, which is um, we're using the L2, the, the sum of squares norm, to normalize the blocks. And then we're doing David Lowe's clipping thing, which what he does is he, he normalizes and then if anything's above point 0.2, um, he clips it and then he renormalizes, um, which is a bit sort of horribly nonlinear and things, but it does seem to help to, to keep the signal um, in, in sort of well constrained. So either that or an L1 followed by a square root. So you normalize <coughs> the sum of modulus to one and then you take the square root. It seems to be the best things to do, but it, it varies a little bit. The, the important thing is that you do have to normalize. Um, and then block overlap, so if, if the blocks are overlapping rather than adjacent, so multi one cell appears multiple times in, in the output vector with different normalizations, then that does help by a factor of two to three or something in a in false positive rate, so it's still worth doing. Um, the effects of different cell sizes, I said that these should be probably aligned to the kind of sizes you see in the, in the class, um, but We've tried various different things. We've tried people, we've tried cars, we've tried bicycles, these kinds of things. Um, they all seem to be giving somewhat similar cell sizes. So typically, we find that rather core spatial cells, um, typically three by th uh, typically um, six by six or eight by eight spatial cells, um, and then two by two or three by three of those in a, in a block is the best thing to do. So somewhat coarser than the typical SIFT. Um, you have to try each class individually, but it does seem, seem to be the case that you can get away with rather coarse spatial um, representation, provided you've done, first of all, the gradient extraction and the, and the oriented voting. So you've kind of, kind of an, a rectification process. And then it doesn't matter too much where the edges appear. So those are the kinds of things. And then we also do um, linear interpolation between the cells and things like this to keep everything smooth to, to avoid aliasing. Um, just to say a little bit, because time is running rather quickly here, um, to say a little bit about um, the overall structure of the detector. Um, if you take the data set and you just take the average gradients, you do see a rather clear form of a person. Um, so even though the people are in all possible <coughs> poses, you still see something that looks roughly like a person. In particular, you see head and shoulders rather clearly, and you tend to see a, sh a region around the shadow of the feet that's very characteristic. And if you look in the detector at the positive weights, then you see again that this positive region around the head and shoulders and around the feet is the most discriminant thing. Um, and if you look at the negative weights, the most discriminant thing is not having a vertical stripe in the middle of the body. So what that's doing is it's suppressing things like lampposts and trees and things that have a nice vertical region near the, near the legs, but then continue up through where the body should be. Okay, um, and the other thing is that I said that overlapping blocks help. Well, it turns out that 
um, the blocks, the, the ones that get the highest weights, are the ones where you have something outside and on the boundary of the person. So what you're doing is you're normalizing edges that you see around the boundary of the person with respect to the outside, not with respect to the inside. That wasn't obvious to start with, but that's what happens. Um, time is really going quickly here, so I'm going to have to accelerate. You, you can um, go over an hour if you want. Yeah, I've only got done about half of the first part of the talks. Um, <laughs> okay, so I said that when you run these detectors, you get multiple detections, um, and you have to fuse them somehow. Um, and so one thing that we worked on is trying to get a little bit more systematic uh, way of fusing these multiple detections um, because it, it, it does affect your results quite a lot. If you, if you sometimes get two detections where you should only have one or sometimes you suppress the whole detection, um, that causes problems. So you can see a typical output of the detector here. Um, so you can hardly see it, but there's a person work, walking here, a person on a motorbike or moped and a a bicycle which got one detection. Okay, you can see there's multiple detections at slightly different positions and scales. So the process that we found that works the best is to take the detector output, so the raw SVM score out, um, to add a little bit of bias to it. Um, with the static image case, which is shown here, you can actually just use zero for the bias. But when we start dealing with moving images, it's important to add some bias. Um, whoops. Um, then we clip that to, ze to zero or positive. So what happens is that if, if I skip forward here, if you get the detector output, you kind of see a sea of sort of negative garbage, sort of floating sort of ripples all over the place, which is only negative scores. And then sometimes you see some positive scores. So what we're trying to do is suppress that sea, get rid of all the ripples, and then only keep some bits that are positive, and then we want to sort of average over those bits. So that's why this clipping is important. Um, then we use mean shift to detect local peaks in the scale space region. Um, and it turns out that mean shift is actually a robust and rapid method to do that. Um, we also tried looking densely over the pyramid, but mean shift seems to do at least as well, if not better. Um, and then finally, we threshold the final, score, final peaks detected to get the final, final results. Um, so just to look at that in detail, here's an image with a number of people but only one person at a given scale and here we show the detection output at that scale so you can see you get a quite strong peak at the person and also that peak is kind of it has a certain spatial width and its height is kind of proportional to the height of the window so the, the shape of the, win the rectangular window um, also determines something like the shape of the peak and it turns out that if you match your mean shift kernel to that shape you get better results um, so typically the mean shift kernel is rather long and thin for people, but rather short. So the width of it is typically the width of a cell, and the height is maybe the width of two cells or something like that. Um, and if you're dealing with cars which are rectangular the other way, then you need to turn things around, obviously. Um, and these things do make quite a difference. Um, let me not go through the details here, but, but choosing the right um, aspect ratio for the kernel, the right size for the kernel, um, and the right degree of spatial scaling spatial smoothing for the kernel, so the right thickness and, and, and scale space is important. Um, just to show the effect of different clipping mappings, I said that we do this hard clipping. Um, now, why do hard clipping? Why not, for example, turn the results of the SVM into probabilities? Or why not do some kind of soft clipping like a logistic method or something? It turned out that <coughs> hard clipping is much better than any of those. We don't have any theory for that, but it, it seems to be empirically the case over a large number of different classes. Um, so this is just showing that. Let me not go into details, but basically the best results are ones with, um, with, with hard clipping. Um, the other thing that's important is the very fine sampling and scale is actually important for these kinds of detectors. So you know, we, we even went down to 1% change in scale as, as we go up through the pyramid, which is very slow, but the results just keep improving as you get finer, um, which is a bit sad because it means that you need a lot of ca ca computation to get the best results. But typically, going down to something like 5% change in, in scale is, is important. If you, typical detectors would use 20 or 30%, and they lose quite a percentage of detections because of that. Um, so finally, a video. Um, this is not spatially smooth. We're just detecting the people individually. Um, you can see that there are some false detections, but we're fairly resistant to things like um, snow and things like that moderately resistant to some occlusions, background clutter. 
I won't go through the whole video. It goes on. And the numbers are <coughs> the value that's being thresholded? Yeah, the number is, is the, the final detection score. So um, anything, um, I guess we show, draw a box around anything that comes out to be positive. Maybe it's more than 0.2 or something. We're not, we're not throwing away too many detections at this stage. Okay, um, so the conclusions for that, it's best to use fine scale features rectify them, then pull spatially, so no gradient smoothing, fine orientation voting, um, and then the spatial voting can be coarser. Um, and it's important also to use gradient magnitude weighting, so don't try to turn things into edges. That, that doesn't work too well. Um, normalization was important. The robust non-maximum suppression or finding of the peaks was important. Um, and the other thing I didn't actually talk about too much uh, is that it's important to retrain the thing on hard negatives. So the, our training process is the following. We have a fixed set of positives and a fixed set of negative images um, from which we also have a fixed sample of initial negatives. Okay? So with the, with the positives and the initial negatives, we train the first detector. Okay? We then look through all the negative images and we take all of the detections that we get there as hard positive as false positives which are hard examples we put as many of those as we can into the training process and we retrain okay and what we do is that we in fact to keep things in, in core memory um, we choose we, we, we just take all these examples if they'll fit into core memory we put all of them in if they won't fit in we randomly subsample them um, to, to fit into core memory so we always can train rather rapidly because we're always in core, core memory but we have as many hard negatives as we, as we can fit in memory um, and doing that increases your performance by at least an order of magnitude in terms of force positive rate. So it's important to do. Um, okay. Um, so I'm wondering if I should actually skip the motion detection and go on to the human motion reconstruction thing because this has been taking a long time. We've also done similar fo feature sets for detecting pe moving people in videos. Um, and in fact... What we do is that we just take the static chain and the motion chain and put them together into a big feature vector. So all I need to tell you about is the motion features that we take. Um, and the motion features, basically what we're going to do is that we're going to use <coughs> optical flow. Why use optical flow? For example, Viola and, and Jones use these derivatives, um, spatial temporal derivatives. Um, you can argue about this, but we find that, that using the flow works much better. Um, in particular, with the scale of the people we're looking at in the images, um, motions can typically be quite a number of pixels, maybe 10 pixels or something, between two adjacent images if, if a person's moving his arm or leg rapidly. Um, and the flow is able to pick that, that up if you do multi-scale flow, whereas spatial temporal derivatives can never pick that up, so they just lose information that's important. Viola and Jones were looking at smaller people, so, so they can do a little bit better. Um, but still we're not quite convinced that, that, that um, their method is the best. For example, the Berkeley work, um, which is very small people, um, was using optical flow again. The process is very similar. We're going to normalize gamma and color, compute flow, then we compute differentials of flow because we want to be invariant in this work to background motion, camera motion, and we want to use the motion of the people relative to themselves to, um, to, to, to characterize the, the existence of the person. Um, so that's where all of the descriptor work is going to be. Then, as before, we're going to accumulate votes over um, <coughs> spatial blocks, normalize, um, and collect them into the, these, these histogram of oriented gradient vectors for use in the detector. Um, so this is the, the, the place where it's not, obvious, not quite obvious what to do. Um, uh, just one thing before going on to that. Um, we tested a number of different optical flow methods. Um, the default one originally was um, the Prosman's method, which is um, it's a nonlinear diffusion-based method. It takes maybe 15, 30 seconds per image. Um, it gives very nice, smooth results. And classically, you say, yes, this is a very nice optical flow method. Um, and if you use this only as the only feature for human detection, it's also the best method to use. But if you use it in combination with static features, it's not the best method to use, and actually a much faster and dirtier method is a better method to use. So what we have, um, you can see here, 
This is a person moving, the coat is flying a little bit, the legs are moving. You can't really see the person in this postman's image. You can see that there's some motion. The camera is also moving here, so there's background motion. Um, whereas in our image, you can see a region where there's clear motion that you might find it difficult to identify as a person, but at least there's some spatial detail there. Um, so the method that we use is very simple. We work multi-scale, sampling finely in scale, so we only change scale with a small amount at each step. We take each pixel, a 5x5 five five block around each pixel. We use the optical flow equations to estimate the motion linearly with one single re-estimation step at each scale. And then we inherit that motion down the next scale, and we keep going down the scale. So there's no spatial smoothing at all, except that pixels that are nearby have, in, have a common ancestor somewhere. So they've had the same, used the same block somewhere further up. So they'll typically have similar motion estimates. But there's no explicit regularization or anything like that in our flow method. It's not iterative in the sense that we don't re-estimate the linear equations. But remember that we're working at a very s small change in scale at each step. So typically, um, that's, it's almost worth an iteration. You, know, you, you, can, you can say that... Do you mean we have very fine steps then? Do you remember well, like a number? Um, I think that the default that we were using here is 20% is change in scale. Um, but as I said before, the finer the change in scale, the better the results. Um, so it's really a matter of your patience. <laughs> um, okay, so the thing with optical flow is that it's a two-dimensional signal, um, whereas the, inten the intensity in the image is only one-dimensional. So you have a few more options for how you're going to calculate gradients. Um, let me see if I... I don't have that. Um, so, so basically, there are, there are two things that you can do. One thing is to say, okay, um, what I'm interested in doing is characterizing motion boundaries. So I want my derivatives to be oriented with the, the moving boundary. Okay. So if I'm moving my leg, I want the derivative to be orthogonal to my leg. Okay. And the other thing that you can do is to say, well, really I'm interested in characterizing differential motions. And in that case, um, across a motion boundary, what I want is the derivative to be oriented in the direction of the difference in the motion which is not necessarily the same as the normal to the leg. Okay? So one scheme is going to give you motion boundaries, which are, very, which are basically occlusion boundaries, so they're very, very similar to the intensity boundaries that you get in images. Okay? So it's good information, but it's information that tends to be rather redundant with the intensity boundaries that you get from the static features. The second case is looking at differential motions between possibly different parts of the body. So it could be looking, tends to be looking rather locally, but it could be looking, for example, at two legs moving relative to one another, or legs and hands and things like this. Um, for that reason, it tends to capture more, in some sense, of the, 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 the global form of the motion, um, and is less redundant with the static features, um, and um, therefore can be, can be a, a better signal if you're including also the static features. Um, and the difference in this is just basically, do you, t do you take the optical flow as being an X signal that you're calculating the gradient of because we're using differential flow, and then you calculate the gradients in much the same way as you calculated the gradients for the intensity image? Or do you take the flow to be the vector, and then you look at spatial differences between flow values? Um, so the question is whether the differences are on the flow, or the, the orientation is the flow orientation or the gradient orientation, basically. Um, I'm not going to go into more detail on that because it's going to take some time. But we use v various different schemes for this second thing where we're looking at relative motion, but typically integrating one cell versus other cells. We're looking at differential motions between those things. We also looked at wavelet schemes and things. You can look up the details in the paper if you're interested. Um, but the results are pretty clear. If you only use motion, then it's best to use um, what we call motion boundary histograms. So it's best to use the... Um, the motion boundaries is information. That gives you the form of the person. Whereas if you integrate both, it's best to use um, what we're calling um, the, these, um, these internal motion things. So it's best to use the, the relative motion of different parts um, and the various different schemes. Um, you can study the differences, and it turns out that histogram oriented gradient type of schemes seem to be the best again. Um, and another thing is that the method works as well on static images as it, 
so, so with zero flow is the original static image method, so we didn't lose anything on, on images with no flow. Um, let me just give you a quick video of that and then move on. Okay, so we're still not quite happy with the results of the um, flow method because this, the integration process, this, this um, multi-scale integration, seems to be working less well in the, in the motion case than the static case. And there's something we don't quite understand about that still. But, so that's still work in progress. But you can see that the motion detect kind of works. Okay. Um, so let me skip this part and go on rather quickly to a second thing, which is finding human pose and motion from images. Um, I'm going to go through this quickly, but let me take 10 minutes for it. Is that okay? We have the road for another half hour. Okay. Um, okay, so this is, so we're really just starting again. We're, we're doing something completely different. We're interested in estimating 3D human body pose or motion from either monocular images or monocular image sequences, so standard video that you might, you know, you might have film something with your home video camera and want to be able to reconstruct the, the motion of the person in it. Um, so the, this is a kind of, it's in contrast to the um, typical conventional motion capture things that's used in the movie industry where you have very specially set up of cameras. You've got mini cameras, um, strobe flashes around the cameras to give you ideal lighting. You've got targets placed on the person so that, so that you can get very accurate 3D positions. Um, Every, everything is, is engineered in order to be able to get the position of the person accurately. So we're interested in the opposite extreme where we just have someone moving in an image or a, in, a, in a video um, without any special instrumentation, without special lighting. We want to be able to appro at least approximate the position, the motion of the person in that case. Um, so um, the goal is to do that and the output is going to be 3D pose and some representation. The input is going to be some kind of descriptors of the image um, and, and nothing more. Okay, um, so applications, well, human-computer interaction is one obvious application. Um, just your interpretation by the computer or whatever. Um, we're also interested potentially in video analysis. Um, so companies like um, like Vicon, who were in this market, would be very interested in, in getting systems that worked without markers and without special cameras, because it just increases the, 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 the domain over which the, the methods could work. Um, and there's, there's various applications, um, there's medicine, there's sport analysis, this kind of thing. Um, potentially, it could be used for um, movie production or television production. Um, but you have to understand that these methods, because they have much less strong geometry and much less strong features, they're never going to reach the precision of a, con a conventional motion capture system. So we're looking more at the range of fairly low precision but kind of easy to do types of things, which might be used, for example, for background characters and games, this kind of thing. Um, and then potentially there are applications in, in surveillance, detecting what people are doing, this kind of thing. Um, so there are basically two ways to do this kind of thing. One is to use a 3D articular model of the person, try to, est try to fit that to the image at each time step, and therefore estimate the joints. Okay? Um, and that's the method we, that we first started using. I'm not going to say very much about that. Um, you run very quickly into problems of local minima. Um, the, the, for, for a given position of the joints in the image, there are thousands of 3D solutions, literally thousands of 3D solutions that are possible. Um, so you very quickly run into, into um, problems of tracking the wrong solution if, if you start tracking. The solutions also sort of merge together and split apart as, as you move your body. Um, so that's the prob problem. And basically what the problem is there is that you're not using information about what motions are typical for people. You're saying, I've got this kinematic representation. Anything that this kinematic model can do, I'm going to assume is possible. Um, whereas we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to say, okay, well, we've seen these people in some kind of training set. We know what they're doing, and we, we want to reproduce that, but we won't be so good at reproducing things that we haven't seen before. That's not necessarily generative versus discriminative, right? A generative model can also have a generative motion model, right? So it could have a whole database of likely mm -hmm. motions. Sure, sure. Um, so if in these generative type 
one thing that people tend to do in this generative modeling framework is they put very strong motion models on, such as walking model. If you do that, you can track things much more easily. Um, but that's kind of specialized. Uh, so maybe another way to say it is that it's hard to marginalize over all these uh, potential uh, motion models. So you would like to marginalize over all possible more. And motion, uh, not motion, sorry, uh, uh, pose parameters. You want to marginalize over all possibilities that give you the exact image, that the input image. And then if you could do that, then you basically do a... Well, you what do you mean marginalize? I mean, what you want as output is the pose, so um, um, you can't marginalize it out. Cause no, you, you would, uh, I, would, uh, I would think of a scheme where you say, OK, here, here is my image. Here is all the pose parameters I can use. I'm going to marginalize over all of them and see what, what gives me the best uh, uh, fit to what I have now. So if you say there's literally 1,000, then you if, say, If okay, I tell you the exact position of the joints in the image, there are thousands of possible 3D solutions, OK? And the only difference in the image generated is subtle perspective effects. Yeah. OK, so it's, it's quite difficult to. OK, sorry, I'm going to refine it. I'm not talking about complete you know, 3D uh, uh, recovery like you did with uh, Christian. But if you say, OK, I want to just know if the person is you know, pointing this way or this way, you know, that's, what you, that's the 2D information. If you can marginalize over, you know, Front and back or well, if you only want 2D information, yes, but then there's no need, no need to do 3D tracking. You can do 2D tracking. Um, so we've I also. This is a. If, okay, maybe I'm, we can talk about it offline. Because right? what I meant is uh, the difference between like a, a generative model and, and a recovery could be the fact that you cannot marginalize over the various uh, poses. Because if you have a generative model, you say, okay, this is my whatever 2D model. I'm going to project it to the 3D model. I'm going to project it onto the input image, yeah. see if it fits, right? And uh, the, the other way to look at it is say, well, I have all my models. I'm going to marginalize over, if I could. I'm not saying yeah, I have a way to do it. And then see if it fits. Or, but so you go both ways. Whether or not it, the, the point is that, that it always fits. You have thousands of solutions, and it always fits. So, so finding the, it's finding the 3D from the 2D that's the hard part of the process. If you only want 2D, you don't need to do that, and things are a lot easier. It's definitely a big step, but I think still, <coughs> can we do very accurate 2D tracking? Is it already possible? I don't we can know. do 2D tracking, um, it whether it's very accurate or not. And so that's what I mean. like, even that step is still hard. And um, sure. definitely the 3D is a much bigger step, I'm not saying. Yeah, but the point is that we can get reasonably results in 3D um, with a very simple method that doesn't really even use tracking, or doesn't essentially use tracking. Um, I better move on here. Um, so the other types of approaches are approaches which are learned, so you, based on examples. Um, the, probably the first work in this area is, is um, Matthew Brand's work on um, <coughs> called Shadow Puppetry, which appeared about 2000, um, which was crude in a number of ways, but it had the basic idea. Um, so what we're interested in doing here is using a training database of examples, learning to reproduce the 3D from the 2D. Um, let me go go on rather quickly. Um, so the basic f thing here is that we're going to take an image, we'll extract some kind of features from the image. We want to learn a black box using machine learning that will reproduce the pose given whatever features we extract from the image, and then we can use that to visualize stuff. Okay. Um, so initially we would use silhouette features in the image, so we'll assume that the background subtraction is possible. We can extract a silhouette. Um, and then later on, we'll look at using an image features. Um, so that's the basic framework. And there's a number of variants. We can also use multi-value regression here if we want to, to try to get multiple solutions. Um, so for the silhouette-based things, um, there are a number of advantages in silhouettes. They're fairly easy to extract from images. Um, they're kind of robust. They code quite a lot of the information, but not all of the information. Um, the method that we came up with is to take the silhouette, we'll take the outline of the silhouette, run a shape context around it. Um, so that converts the silhouette into a, a set of votes in, in the shape context space, which in our case is 60-dimensional. And then we vector quantize that space into 100 bins. So that gives us a 100-dimensional vector. The advantage of this process is that it's quite robust to, um, if, I, if I mess up the silhouette in this region here, I'm still getting votes 
for the right form of the upper body coming from here. So when I vector quantize, I'll still get a number of bins which are right, even if a few of the bins are wrong. Um, so we've, we've chosen a method that's fairly robust to, um, to problems in silhouette extraction and that codes a lot of the form of, that, of the silhouette. Um, let me not go over regression methods. Um, we, we, we've, we're using basically linear least squares regression with a number of different um, um, damping factors or regularizing factors. Um, so the basic damped least squares is one thing. Uh, the other thing I should say is that we, we can use either linear basis, so we take the input features as we extracted them, or we can use kernel type bases, so we're taking basically examples, poses, and using those to reconstruct. Um, we use regularized least squares regression, or we also use a sparse method called relevance vector machine, which kills a lot of the kernels and therefore gives us a sparser and more rapid to calculate solution, which is almost as good as the least squares, sometimes even a little bit better. Um, but let me not go into details of that. We tried a dozen different types of regressors. Um, these linear things, relevance vector machines, linear SVMs, um, kernel SVMs, um, they all give very similar results. Um, it turns out the kernel methods are a little bit better than the linear ones, um, and SVM or RVM seems to be a good type of regressor to use. Um, so the final results we're getting on the order of five or six degrees of error um, on average over the training set. Okay. But there's a problem with the, this method. Um, the silhouettes are quite ambiguous, so it's difficult to tell sometimes um, from a silhouette whether a person's facing forward or backward, which leg is forward, this kind of things. So in fact, we get fairly good results in 85% of the images, and we get errors in about 15% of the images, which the person is facing the wrong way or has the wrong leg forward or something. So if you make a video from this, the person walks right, and then it glitches, and then it walks right again, and then it glitches again, which is not good. Um, so the way to get around this, well, there are two ways to get around this. One way is to do um, a tracking method. So we embed the whole thing into a tracking framework. And because we're working from the image to the 3D, so we're working in a kind of discriminative or regressive framework, we also wanted to do the tracking that way. So instead of using a conventional Kalman filter, we used a, what's called a, con a conditional filter, um, which works from... Um, basically the observations, which can be the previous time step and the observation in the image, to the 3D state, rather than going from the 3D state down into the image and then trying to invert that rule. Um, so basically what that means is that we've learned a motion model and a direct regression model that goes from the prediction of the motion model and from the observed features, and we also include the prediction, motion prediction in the kernel, and that's important because that's what's going to allow us to disambiguate things. If we include the motion prediction, what happens is that you select the kernels that give you the good motion prediction. The, the motion prediction gives you a 3D pose, which is about right. Um, and then that allows you to select the right inverse solution to go from the image back to the 3D. And so this glitching process doesn't occur because you're selecting the right solution using the, the motion prediction. So there's a nonlinearity there which is important. Apart from that, we're okay. Let me skip this thing on discriminative tracking and just show some images. Okay, so this is a motion, a walking sequence, synthetic images generated using Poser. You can see that you get pretty good results, um, significantly better than you can get with a model-based approach. Um, there's a little bit of lead and lag here. Um, there's not any glitching in this process. Some of the arm motions are not exactly right, but it's still fairly convincing for a very simple process that you know you can essentially run in real time um, and to get these results out. Um, we're just giving some curves, but let's not show those. Um, and then using real images, you can see our silhouette subtraction is not ideal, but we still get a moderately plausible work, walking motion from it. OK. Um, so the other thing that we've done, that way was it, it has a single valid hypothesis. Um, we've also used what we call multi-valued regression, so a regression method that, given an example image, is capable of producing several possible outputs with associated probabilities. Okay? Um, and typically we find that in about 50% of the case there's only one possibility, um, and 
another 25%. There's two possibilities. Sometimes there are three, but there are not very often more than three possibilities. Um, so the, there's ambiguity, but the ambiguity is not that big. Um, whereas remember that there are thousands of possibilities if you just do the kinematics. Um, the way we train this is that we take the, the combined data, so the poses, the training data that has 3D poses and um, image features, and we do a kind of a, a Gaussian mixture fitting to it with the special constraint that we want these Gaussian mixture components to be quite thin. So what they're doing is that they're learning kind of regression surfaces so that you can go up from the um, observed image to the 3D pose with something that doesn't have too much uncertainty in the pose direction. So we're constraining the covariance of the, um, the mixture components to have this quite thin special shape. Um, and then if you do that, you get these um, probabilistically weighted outputs in your regression method, which you can then use, for example, in a, a condensation tracker. So we have video of this. This is a somewhat more general motion with the person sort of doing slightly odd walk and moving back and forward and things. Um, we have fairly severe problems with foot skate here, so we need to do some computer graphics correction. Um, and that's one of the reasons this doesn't look quite so convincing. But if you look at the angular errors, it's actually OK. And probably we, can, we, we would need to do a little bit more processing. But the footscape really kills visual re reality, unfortunately. Um, OK, so we can also do this for gesture recognition. Um, we're currently doing a real-time version of this um, method. This is just some basketball signals. Um, which we can label as the correct thing. Um, okay, so let me go very quickly over the last thing. Um, so that's all using silhouettes. <coughs> what we'd like to be able to do is also use dense images without silhouette subtraction. Um, so the method that we tried is the following. Um, we take the image window. We assume that the person has been approximately localized in the window, so we're cheating in that sense, but we don't know what the pose is, and we'd like to recover the pose. We put a, a grid of these SIFT blocks down on the image. We calculate descriptors, so much as for the human detector, and then we want to do the regression from that. Okay. Um, and we also experimented with an additional <coughs> stage, which is designed to suppress background clutter using non-negative factorization. Um, but basically, from either of those two, you can do regression and, and estimate the, the pose of the person. Um, so non-negative factorization, let me just show the effect of it. Um, if you put a block down here, you can see that there's a strong background image, background gradient here, which appears in the input patch. But, af but after the non-negative factorization, that's gone away, and you only see the gradients that belong to the person. Okay? So the way that works is that non-negative factorization, is, it's kind of a, a way of expressing an image patch. Or here, here what it is, is it's a histogram of oriented gradient patch. Um, in terms of a set of positive basis elements. So positive element basis with positive coefficients. There's an iterative method to, to train it. Um, and what happens is that you learn this thing over a training set. And where things are consistent, like very often in the training set, there's a shoulder about there. So you see gradients there. Um, and the basis pick up on that and represent that, whereas it's rather rare to see um, a background edge at a given position because the background's changing when we train it. Um, so it learns to kind of ignore the background and focus in on the foreground. Okay, so you can see some results of that um, on poses. This is with poser. These are images just taken from the web, so they have nothing to do with the training set, nothing to do with um, the, the set that we use for learning. You can see that the poses are not exact, but they're kind of okay. And if I go to this sequence here, um, so this is a person who's... Um, we, we synthesized the background here to make the task more difficult. We didn't get the subtraction quite right, so you can see a little aura around the person, but that's not too important for the method. Um, the person is different from the person used for training, um, but is doing very similar motions. Um, and I should say that for the silhouette method, we have reasonably good generalization, but for this method, the generalization is to a different motions is less good. Um, and you can see that we're getting reasonable um, reproduction here, but it's not ever exact. It's just kind of qualitatively getting approximately the right kinds of motion. So if you wanted to use it in a movie application where you were re-rendering an actual model of the person in exactly the pose, it wouldn't be good. But if you want to use it in a human interface thing or something like that, it's probably good enough to sort of know what the person is doing. Also for okay. a movie, if you 
parameters to an animator, it will correct it much faster. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, I mean, here, here also, I mean, if you really wanted to do this in a movie thing, you, then you, you'd want to then take a model, reproject it in the image, do some fine adjustment, this kind of thing. We're also looking into that, but we haven't really done any of that yet. But I think that will work. Okay, so that's the summary, and that's the end of the talk. Um, so we have reasonably good, low accuracy, but, but easy to do, and, and reasonably rapid to calculate estimates of human pose. Um, based on either silhouettes or, or, or dense images and learning-based techniques. Um, the method is pretty simple to implement compared to a model-based method. Um, it's reasonably robust and it tends to capture the kind of spirit of the motion, even if it doesn't get the exact joint values right. Um, but it's certainly not as accurate as a full model-based method. Okay. Okay. Thank you.